Our next speaker is Christopher Hitchens. He's arguing against the motion. Christopher Hitchens is uh, British by origin, but he has spent most of his working life in the United States. He is a writer, journalist, and commentator, particularly well known for his um, trenchant and uh, views and very original thinking. He works on Vanity Fair magazine, where he memorably wrote uh, a rather a less than complimentary profile, I would have to say, Christopher, of uh, the late Mother Teresa. Uh, so, Christopher Hitchens, let us hear what you have to say. Your time starts now. Please make your way to the podium. Well, Your Grace, um, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, um, and Zainab, who did something that I almost never have had experienced before, uh, paid a compliment to my shirt before we came on tonight. <laughs> so I was able to return by pointing to hers, which you, you're feasting your eyes on now, and saying, I once saw Norman St. John Stevens, now Lord Stevens of Forley, wearing a shirt just like that on the television. And he was asked by his interviewer, gosh, what a lovely shirt, where did you get it? And Steve asked, said, do you really like it? He said, I, I call it sort of crushed cardinal. <laughs> I might add, in the spirit of fraternity, which I'm sure will inform this entire soiree, that the mere existence of Lord Steve Asa Foley is testimony to the breadth of the church. Um, now, I'm sorry, though, to have to begin by disagreeing with his grace. Um, if you're going to be a serious grown-up person and appear to defend the Catholic Church in public in front of an educated and literate audience, you simply have to start by making a great number of heartfelt apologies and requests for contrition and forgiveness. Now you might ask, you're fully entitled to ask, brothers and sisters, who am I to say that? Well, in the Jubilee millennium year of 2000, the Vatican spokesman, Bishop Piero Marini, said, explaining a whole sermon of apology given by His Holiness the Pope that was supposed to cover the entire history of the Church in its Jubilee year, that I'll quote uh, Bishop Marini directly, he said, given the number of sins we've committed in the course of 20 centuries, reference to them must necessarily be rather summary. Well, I think Bishop Marini had that just about right. I'll have to be summary too but I think he said just about the least of it. His Holiness on that occasion, it was March the 12th, 2000, if you wish to look it up, begged forgiveness for, among some other things, the Crusades, the Inquisition, the persecution of the Jewish people, injustice towards women, that's half the human race right there, <laughs> and the forced conversion of indigenous peoples, especially in South America. And that followed a whole series of preceding apologies, or apologies, I would say, of a kind, made by the late Pope John Paul, who, it troubles me not at all to say, was a very impressive and serious human being. Um, it followed no less than 94, 94 count them, uh, public recognitions on his part of appalling crime and error and cruelty and stupidity and offenses to the free intelligence, ranging from, I shall be summary, like Bishop Marini, the African slave trade, apologized for in 1995, uh, the admission that Galileo was right <laughs> about the relationship between the sun and the earth and other orbs, which came in 1992, one might add, no, I won't say, it's too easy to say better late than never, here, I said it. <laughs> to violence and torture, legalized torture. Torture was legalized and institutionalized by the Roman pontiff during the Counter-Reformation. That came in 1995. Um, and for silence during Hitler's final solution, or Shoah, as well as in 1999 coming in just under the Millennium Jubilee wire, an apology for the burning alive in the main square of Prague of the great Czech Protestant Jan Hus. Um, since that big fiesta of forgiveness that uh, began in, uh, well, culminated, I might say, in 2000, fiesta of forgiveness, fiesta of asking for it, the papacy is also asked to be forgiven for the sack of Constantinople and the massacre of Byzantine Christianity in April 1204 as part of the Fourth Crusade, 
the anathema on all Eastern Orthodox Christians as unbelievers, heretics, and people dwelling outside the health of the church was lifted only in 1964. I call your attention to that. He also expressed sorrow about the murder and forced conversion of Serbian Orthodox Christians in the Balkans during the Second World War. And it doesn't end there. There are smaller but significant, um, equally significant, avowals of a very bad conscience. These have included uh, regret for the rape and the torture of orphans and other children in church-run schools in almost every country on earth, from Ireland to Australia. And I'm pleased to see that due reconsideration is now being given, and may in fact have been given, to the hellish, I choose the word carefully, doctrine of limbo, St. Augustine's uh, cruel and stupid disposal problem, solution, to a non-existent problem, that is to say, the destination of the souls of unbaptized children. Up until now, Catholic parents have been taught that's where their unbaptized children went, a form of torture that's sometimes worse than the physical. Now it seems that this piece of Augustinian sadism is undergoing reconsideration as well. But remember, this is from a church that, on the whole, cannot err. We still await a more direct admission for example, I would give some suggestions of my own while we're at it. I would like them to take back the Concordat made with Adolf Hitler, the first treaty he ever signed, giving the church a monopoly over education in Germany in exchange for the dis dissolution of the Catholic Center Party to give the Nazi Party a clear run. I'd have apologized for the latter and pact with Mussolini, myself, also the first treaty ever signed by that fascist dictator. I would also think I'd want to reconsider the fact that Father Tizo head of the Nazi puppet state in Slovakia, was a priest in holy orders. That the Croatian fascist puppet state, the Ustasha state of Ante Pavlic, was also operating under full clerical protection and disguise, as was the regime of General Franco and the dictator Antonio Salazar. And I'd also want, I really think I would beg forgiveness for this, I don't think the German church should have asked Hitler's birthday to be celebrated from the pulpit every year until he died. These are very serious matters, and they're not to be laughed off by references to the occasional work of Catholic charities. But I draw your attention not just to the apologies, ladies and gentlemen, but to the evasive and euphemistic form that they take. Uh, Joseph Ratzinger, the current Pope, considered by some, by Catholics, to be the Vicar of Christ on Earth, says of Indians, of the Indians who were massacred in the course of conversion in Brazil, after the apology had been made to them, he said, nonetheless, it must be remembered that before we came to convert them, they were silently awaiting the arrival of the church. I don't think that's a very genuine kind of apology to you. In his comment, one of the few he's made on the institutionalization of rape and torture and maltreatment of children in Catholic institutions, he said, it's a very severe crisis which, which involves us, he said, in the following in the need for applying to these victims the most loving pastoral care. Well, I'm sorry. They've already had that. <laughs> and to say that this is the responsibility laid upon you by the, the horrific admission that you've already had to make is not accepting responsibility in any adult sense. When I say child abuse was institutional, how dare I say so? How can I prove it? How can I prove such a thing? Well, I'll ask, the, I'll ask His Grace and I'll ask Anne Whittacombe. Where is Cardinal Bernard Law now? Where is he? Where is the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston, whose resignation was indignantly demanded, finally, by 50 members of the church and by the whole laity of Massachusetts, who also demanded his prosecution for the promotion and protection and covering up and uh, apology for and defense of uh, people whose crimes against children are too revolting to specify. And he's not in the jurisdiction of Massachusetts now, as perhaps you know. He's the Supreme Vicar of the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, personally appointed by the Pope to that as well as many other important sinecures. And in 2005, this man, a fugitive from justice and from, and from complicity in the filthiest crime that it's possible for a human being to imagine, was one of those voting in conclave to decide who the next Vicar of Christ on earth will be. I don't know. I think, I think I'd like to hear a bit more shame about this. I think I'd like to see a bit more confrontation with the, with, the, with the reality of the business. Now, this is a, a, 
a serious question, as I've said, and Whitakam very often rightly, in my opinion, attacks the climate of moral relativism and of anything goes that can very well be the handmaiden of postmodernist hedonistic culture. I very often am glad that she points these thing, things out. But the rape and torture of children is not something to be relativized. It's not something to be excused as a few bad priests. It's certainly not to be excused by the hideously false claim made by some Catholic conservatives that this wouldn't have happened if queers hadn't been allowed into the church. I'm sorry to say that queerdom in the church is an old story too. Um, and it's worse, it's much worse than pornography and it's much worse than bad language on TV. And it's the crime that cries out for punishment. It's the thing that if we were accused of on this side of the house, we would die rather than admit. And if we were guilty of it, we'd kill ourselves. And it's the one thing the church has decided to excuse itself for under this papacy. 